We're here today. So many people here is what I meant to say. Anyway, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. You know, there's this crazy notion that's out there today that many Christians have, and it's not true, and it deals with money. See, there are a lot of Christians out there today who believe that money is the root of all evil. And you know what? I find that kind of ironic because we use money all the time, don't we? And I wonder how uncomfortable that must make people who believe that, that they have to handle something that they think is evil. The truth of the matter is money is not evil. The Bible is crystal clear. It is the love of money that is evil. It is having the wrong relationship with your money that's wrong. You know, I want you to be happy, but even more importantly, God wants you to be happy. Amen. And so we're going to talk about money this morning. We're going to talk about the connection between money and happiness. Um, can I get everyone to please stand and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 24. Once again, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. Verse 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so that if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we just thank you Lord, that you are a generous God, Lord. That as we look at our lives, Lord, we know that we are not worthy of your grace. We know that we're not worthy of your love. And yet, Lord, you love us anyway. And so, Lord, I'm just helping. I'm praying today that you will help us to understand how to find happiness, especially in relationship with our money, Lord. That this message would speak true, that this message would help people to understand that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me be seated, please. You know, you've probably heard people say, maybe even a preacher or two say that money won't make you happy. I mean, I'm sure you've heard somebody said that. Maybe you've heard it in church and you've even said amen. And even though you've done that, you don't believe it. You know, we might, we might say that, but we really don't believe it. In fact, I'm sure if I said money won't make you happy, there's somebody here like Cody would say, test me. <laughs> volunteers and you're going to have some kind of experiment you're going to find out you know money can make you happy i'll be the one to volunteer they'll all follow you over the bank on monday and so even though we say it, even though it sounds right in our heads deep down in our hearts we know it's not true so let me say this one more time there is a connection between money and happiness but it's not what most of us think most of us think that the connection between happiness and money is more but let me ask you a question. How much more do you need to be happy? Don't say that out loud. But how much more do you need to be happy? See, all happy people have peace. And so how much more money do you need to have peace? And I think the universal answer to that question is what? It's more than I currently have. I don't care where you are on that financial totem pole, whether you make $20,000 a year, whether you make $50,000 a year, $100,000 a, a year, or a million, I think your answer is going to be the same more. And that's because we've been programmed to believe that having more money equals what? More happiness. You know, there is a connection between your money and your happiness, but it's not more. And so let's think about that for a minute. We all know people who have more money than us, and yet sometimes they're miserable, aren't they? I mean, they've got the nice house, they've got the nice boat, they've got the jet skis, they've got the RV, they've got the dirt bikes. 
And yet the wife can't stand the husband, the husband can't stand the wife, the kids can't stand the parents. They're miserable. And by the same token, we know people who have less than we have. And sometimes they are happier than we are. Amen? Amen. And so the connection between money and happiness is not having more. The connection between money and happiness is not having more money. The connection between money and happiness is learning to manage the money we have. You know, there is a clear connection between how you manage your money and the degree of your happiness. I mean, how many of you like getting phone calls from debt collectors or from people you owe money to? How many of you like that? How many of you say, man, it just makes me so happy? <laughs> I had a call the other day from the electric company, and they told me they were cutting off my power because I didn't pay my bill, and you know what? I'm so happy. I can hardly wait for the water company to call. <laughs> or, hey, honey, look. The car company's towing our car. I'm so happy now we get to walk everywhere we want to go. You guys see what I'm getting at? There is a direct correlation between how you manage your money and the level of your happiness. And let me just say this. Anything that undercuts your peace, like debt, undercuts your happiness. And that's why a few months back we did that program called Financial Peace University. And I want you to notice that middle word, peace. Financial peace. Peace. You know, I want you to be happy. And like I said, even more importantly, God wants you to be happy. And so that's why we have that program and be able to help you with that. You know what? If you don't manage your money, then your money is out of control. And any time that, that something in our life is out of control, you know what we have? Amen. We have anxiety. anxiety. We have anxiety. I remember something that happened about 30 years ago. I was in the Navy. Actually, there was two things that happened. One was very uh, traumatic. I was in the Navy and one of our screws got bent and so we had to go into dry dock. And while we were there, um, there were three Robinsons that were on that ship. My brother, myself, and a, another Robinson named Bo. And while we were there, Bo was killed in a car wreck. In fact, it was tragic because when they told me that one of the Robinsons had died, they didn't say who it was. And so I didn't know if it was my brother or not. And my brother would tell me later on that him and Bo got in a fight over who was going to sit in the front seat. He got mad and left. And that girl, that lady, she was drunk and she ended up wrecking the car. She was completely out of control and it cost him his life. The same time we were there, one of the, my shipmates went and got his motorcycle and brought it and he said, Dale, how would you like to go for a ride with me on my motorcycle? I was young and dumb back then. I climbed on. I didn't have a helmet. And the next thing I know, we're flying down the road over 100 miles an hour. Those little stripes in the middle of the road were going just like that. And I remember thinking to myself, if we crash, if we crash, you're going to be picking pieces of me up off of that road. So I didn't like that. I couldn't wait to get off that motorcycle because the situation was completely out of my control. I didn't have a, a hold of the handlebars. I couldn't control the gas. I couldn't control the brake. And, and anyways, I was thinking we were going to wreck. And you know what? When your finances are out of control, you have a lot of anxiety because you're just waiting for the crash to come as well. Amen? Amen. Now, the reason your money might be out of control is something I said earlier. Maybe it's you have a wrong relationship with your money. And that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You know, some of you, you just, you just read right past that. You think, well, that Jesus isn't talking to me. I don't love my money. I don't take my money and put it under my pillow and blow kisses to it all night. You know, Jesus knew that we would think that. And that's why he added two other words, not just to love, but to be devoted to. Now, this might sound strange, but the chief competitor of our devotion is not Satan. The, the chief competitor with our devotion is not even sin. I want you to notice that Jesus didn't say you can't serve both God or Satan. He didn't say you couldn't serve both God or sin. No, he said you cannot serve both God or your money or your wealth. If you have a King James, it's mammon. It's the idea of your possessions. You can't 
serve your possessions and serve God at the same time. Jesus, what he's saying is he, he's saying you might not be in love with your money, but is it possible that maybe you are a little too devoted to your money? And so the question is, how do we know? How do we know if we might be a little bit too devoted to our money, to our wealth, to our possessions, to our desire for things? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever bought something that you couldn't afford? And you knew you couldn't afford it, but you went out and bought it anyway? Maybe some of you right now are still trying to figure out, how in the world am I going to pay for that? See, sometimes our desire gets the best of us. Sometimes we go after what we call an impulse buy. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. There was a time a few years back where Bank of America sent us a credit card, and I thought they were really nice. They gave me a $20,000 credit line. And on top of that, they said, well, you know what? If you pay $100 a year, you'll get zero plus prime. And guess what I ended up doing? I ended up buying things that I could not afford. It's like Dave Ramsey said, I did not feel the pain of what I was buying. That's why we try real hard today to use money so we can actually feel the pain of what we're buying. And after a while, we had like $20,000 in debt. And the reason I'm telling you that, I'm, telling, I'm just like you. I'm not any different than you. I've made poor decisions in the past. And you know what happened? I had anxiety in a lot of it. Now, we were fortunate. We had a house at the time. And we ended up selling that house and moving back here. And we made a profit out of that, off that house. But just think about this. What would we have done if we didn't have that house? You see, when your desire for things is greater than your common sense, unhappiness will always follow. Let me say that again. When your desire for things is greater than your common sense, unhappiness is sure to follow. And I, I know we don't like truisms today. We don't like the idea that things are always true, but in this case, that is a truism. See, the problem is desire can enslave you. That's why Jesus, I want you to notice something. He used the word master. And when it comes down to it, the question you have to ask is, who's in control? Am I in control, or is my desire in control? Who's the master, and who's the slave? That's the question that, that we have to, to ask. See, unhealthy desire leads to discontentment. See, when desire is out of control, it really doesn't matter what we have. We're never going to be content with it because as soon as we see somebody who has something that we don't have or we see somebody who has something that's better than what we have, we become discontent. Andy Stanley says, discontentment is never being satisfied with what I have because I know what you have. Let me ask you a question. If you had several million dollars, <coughs> would you be content? Somebody's supposed to say something. Yeah, try me. <laughs> you would think that, though, wouldn't you? When you think you had a few million dollars in the bank, that you'd be content. You'd have enough money to do just about anything you want to do, right? Most people. You can't take it with you. But I think, honestly, most people, if they had a few million dollars in their bank, most people would have some level of contempt. That doesn't mean, I'm not talking about managing money here. I'm talking about having money. That's a whole other issue, and we're going to get back to that. But to me, if I, if I had a few million dollars in the bank, I think I would be pretty content with the idea I have enough money to pay all my bills. I'd have enough money to get whatever retirement I needed. I'd have enough money to go on vacation if I wanted to go on. And so I think I, think I would probably be content with a few million dollars. But not everybody. In fact, if you've been following the Seahawks at all, you know they won the Super Bowl two years ago. They almost won the Super Bowl last year, and they should have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's still a sore spot for me too. But here's the thing I want to point out is when teams like that are successful, the players start making more money. And so they renewed a bunch of the contracts. And the problem was, even though there were players that were making millions of dollars, even though there were players that were under contract and agreed to a certain amount of money, guess what happened when the other players got new contracts? They became discontent. In fact, a great example of that is Cam Chancellor of the Seahawks. He was making millions of dollars. He had agreed to a contract, but when he found out what some of the other guys were getting, he's holding out right now. That's the problem. When you start looking at what other people have, 
we become discontent. Kind of like that picture up there. That little boy's got an ice cream, but notice what he's doing. She's got a bigger ice cream. See, that's, that's the problem when our desires get out of control. We start looking at what other people have. The natural outcome is that. You see, greed drives discontentment. None of us are greedy. None of us see greed when we look in the mirror. Greed is always that shadowy figure who lives in the, in the shadows out there, that person who lives in the shadows. Greed is the idea that everything that comes into my hands is for my consumption. Here's why most of us don't recognize greed for what it is. It's because we believe that deep down that we're very generous. And, and some of you are generous. You know, some of you, you give to the church, and let me tell you something, we could not do what we do without you. But this is not a statement about giving to the church. <coughs> this is a statement about the greed that's out there lurking in the shadows that we do not see because it is so hard to see. Now, Jesus gives us one of the greatest examples of generosity in the story of the widow's life. And sometimes I think people misunderstand what Jesus was trying to say. He was talking about generosity. If you know that story, you know that there were people that were giving large amounts of money. And then there's this poor widow. All she's got to her name are two little copper coins called mites. And so she almost tries to sneak in there and drop them in so nobody can see. But Jesus noticed. And Jesus said, why? Even though they had given more money than she did, he said she had given more. And I think what he was really saying is that she was more generous than they were. She gave all she had. They gave their leftovers. Let me give you an illustration of how that might work today. Now, Bob, how many hot dogs did you bring? 120. 120 hot dogs. And Roger, how many uh, hamburger patties? Oh, I guess he's over there. I think he brought about 80. Anyway, but imagine this. Imagine if Bob and Roger and I got together and we decided, although I'm just going to kind of tag with them, we decided because we brought all the hamburgers and all the hot dogs, that that was for us. And so we start eating hamburgers and hot dogs, and we start gorging ourselves, and we just stuff ourselves to the point that we're just almost sick. And then we say, you guys can have what's left over. Let me ask you a question. Would you consider that generosity? You see, that's the way that's the way we think. Hear me now, that's the way we think when we have a wrong relationship with our money. We think me first, you later. Me first, you later. The other thing that we need to understand about greed is that greed is an appetite, and appetites are never satisfied. Appetites are never satisfied. You know, if, we, if we're discontent, if we're not satisfied, are we happy? The answer is no. Greed is the appetite for more and more and more. Now, here in America, we don't stop when the money runs out. That's because we've got credit cards. We've got payday loans. We've got uh, lines of credit, home equity lines of credit. And that leads probably to maybe one of the greatest happiness killers of all. Debt. Debt. Andy Stanley says, it's better to live with I want than to try to live with I have and I have no way of paying for it. <laughs> he says, each has a tension to it, but which tension is easier to live with? I want something and I don't have it, there's tension, or I have something and I have no idea how I'm going to pay for it. I think that's greater tension. I like to talk about it's the difference between being to save for versus being saved from. You know, when we do the right thing, we save for the things we want. When we don't do the right thing, we need to be saved from the foolish decisions that we make. And so it really is the difference of being saved to save for or being saved from. You see, debt is when you, became, when you become the slave of your desires. You, be the, you become the, the slave of your debtor, no matter who that debtor might be, whether it's a bank, whether it's a car company, whether it's a store like J.C. Penney's or Sears. You become a slave. I remember a few years ago, I bought a TV, I think it was from Sears, and they offered me like 5% off if I got a Sears card. 
And so I went ahead and got that card. I don't think I ever used it. But I looked at the, at the fine print, and you know what it said? It said the interest rate was like over 20%. I'm thinking, man, that's crazy. That's slavery. Discontentment. Greed. Debt. Which of those three bring happiness into your life? Discontentment, you can't be happy with that because you're always looking at what somebody else has. And you can't be happy. Greed is an appetite, and as I said already, appetites are never satisfied. And debt is a cycle... And as long as you are in that cycle, guess what you have? You have anxiety. And as long as you have anxiety, you will never have happiness. And so what's the answer here? The answer is one word. It is stop. Stop thinking that more money means more happiness. The Financial uh, Credit Bureau figured out something a few years ago that all of us need to remember, and that is giving money to people solely on the basis of income is a disaster. See, it doesn't matter what a person's income is if they can't manage their money. Let me say this right now, that if you can't manage $20,000 a year, I guarantee you will never be able to manage $200,000 a year. If you get more money, the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to have more anxiety because when you have more money, when you have a greater income, you know what you can do? You can borrow more. And so what happens is that hole becomes a whole lot deeper. In fact, I heard a story about a person who won the lottery. I can't remember if they won $5 million, somewhere close to that. But within two years, they were $2 million in debt. Now here's the irony. Before they won that money... There was no way in the world they could have gotten $2 million in debt because nobody would have loaned them the money. The other thing that breaks my heart about the lottery is people think that more money is going to be more happiness. But like I said, if you don't know how to manage it, it isn't going to be any good. Because within a few years, you're going to be broken. Many times you're going to be in worse shape. And what breaks my heart is there have been people that have actually won the lottery who have committed suicide. Because they were devastated because they lost all that money that they thought was going to bring them all their happiness. See, the answer is to manage your money and don't let your money manage or master you. If you are a Christian, you have a master and his name is not supposed to be MasterCard. <laughs> you know, there is a clear connection between how you manage your money and your happiness. So let me say this as I close this message out this morning. That if you struggle managing your money, when we have our next Financial Peace University class, I think it's nine weeks of classes actually, um, do yourself a favor and come to that class. Because I want you to be happy, and I know God wants you to be happy. And let me just share a little bit. Kelly may be uncomfortable with this, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, we, we, I not only really led that class, I don't feel like we're doing financial stuff. But, you know, we took that, I not only led that class, but I took that class. And when we started, we had about a $5,000 credit card debt. But since we've taken that class, we have completely eliminated that $5,000 debt. We now have a $1,000 emergency fund in case something happens. We started paying extra on Kelly's student loans, and we paid it off. And now we're working on, on mine, paying extra. And so my point is, you really can get help through this class.